everybody doing online? You can hear me? We can hear you. Awesome, thanks. So let's see. <clears throat> Trying to give you a kind of breakdown of what we're going to do today. So we're going to talk about text mining. So we're kind of skipping ahead a little bit. I rearranged some stuff, and then we're going to look at uh, text mining in R. So I figured we'd talk about text mining. Then we're going to install R, and we'll go into a brief little intro into R, and then we'll do the assignment, which is on R and text mining. So, um, so that's kind of the plan. Let's see. All right, so this week is on text analytics, text mining, and sentiment analysis, uh, which is a, it's all an application of text analytics. So it's a good technique for getting actionable uh, information from large amounts of unstructured text data. So <clears throat> some text mining concepts, most data is unstructured or in an unstructured form. Often text uh, is increasingly in pictures and videos, which gets a little more difficult to analyze. And this type of data is rapidly increasing. So businesses need to be able to analyze this type of data to be successful and competitive. So consider all of the text analytics that goes into social media and online reviews. Anybody use Amazon and use online reviews? So a lot of work goes into uh, those reviews with respect to making sure they're not fake, which has been a major problem in the past several years. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, anyways, the solution to the uh, the unstructured text problem is the use of text mining, which is a semi-automated process of extracting knowledge from unstructured data. So text analytics and text mining. The diagram shows a relationship between text analytics and other aspects of analytics that you can see on, on the bottom. Uh, the many different areas that feed into the text analytics arena, which include natural language processing, linguistics, machine learning, uh, computer science, management science, artificial intelligence. Machine learning and artificial intelligence kind of one and the same for what we do in this class. And then um, up here, text mining is the bulk of what is in text analytics, uh, uh, the related aspects of information retrieval. So that's using um, basically text mining to pull documents, whereas the other ones are a little deeper. And we'll talk about kind of the, the differences where those, those two break. So um, when looking at the differences and similarities of data mining and text mining, both are looking for patterns and are semi-automated. The difference is in the types of data or data mining examines structured data and text mining looks at unstructured data, including Word documents, PDFs, text documents, HTML, XML. So text mining does this by creating a structure in the data and then mining that structured data. Uh, so I thought I'd make my lecture a little more interesting by putting uh, cats in the slides. Because I know people love cat videos, and that's probably what half the people are doing, right? Anyhow, so text mining is very useful, as so much data is text. Probably 90% of the, uh, the, the data we have out there is in text format. So it's especially heavily utilized to examine things like uh, court documents, research articles from an academic standpoint, quarterly reports, discharge summaries from clinical decision support, Molecular interactions, uh, patent files, customer comments, for like you know, Amazon, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. And then it's also used to create spam filters for email, uh, prioritize emails and categorize them, and to generate automatic responses to emails. Um, it's also in like predictive text, you know, 
know, when you're typing an email and it types for it for you, or on texting, and it autocorrects maybe. Not the best examples of the power of text mining, but that's getting there. All right, text mining applications. So text mining is used in many different areas. Information extraction identifies key phrases and uh, relationships in text, commonly used for named entity recognition, uh, like for calling people, organization, and place names, as well as expressions. Uh, topic tracking looks at user profiles and documents a user views to predict other articles that might be of interest to the user. Like targeted advertising, it's a lot, but uh, uh, I know that they do at NBC when they are trying to properly place uh, commercials into shows. Uh, summarization is the process of summarizing a document to save a reader time. I like what I'm doing right now. This way you don't have to read the textbook. I can summarize it in you know, 20, 30 minutes. <coughs> um, categorization identifies the main themes of a document to put them in a predefined category. Clustering is the process of grouping similar documents without predefined categories. And concept linking connects related documents by identifying shared concepts. Question answering is the process of finding the best answer to a question through pattern matching. OK, so uh, you're going to need to understand the text mining terminology to help with the assignment coming up. So I'll go over these, and then we'll talk about them again as we're going through the assignment. But basically, um, these are the commonly used terms in text mining. Structured data has a predetermined format and is organized with simple data values and stored in databases. However, unstructured or semi-structured data, which is what we're going to be working with in text mining, um, our data that does not have a predefined format and is often stored in the form of text documents. Then we're going to take that uh, structured or unstructured data and we're going to turn it into a corpus. A corpus uh, in the context of linguistics is a large structured set of text that has been prepared and is ready for analysis. So we're going to take something like an email or a speech or a, a document and we're going to turn it into something we can actually analyze and that's what Purposes. So a term is a word or phrase taken from the corpus using natural language processing, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, concepts are the features created by analyzing a collection of documents through either manual, statistical, or rule-based, or some hybrid of those uh, methodologies, leading to a higher level of abstraction. Stemming is the process of reducing inflection of the root stem of the word, like the stem would be steep, like I steep my tea every morning, but it groups with the words steeped, steeping, steeper, which doesn't go with tea, but rather you know mountain climbing, unless there's like some way to make tea with a tool that I'm unaware of. But stop words also called noise words, are words that are filtered out after processing a natural language uh, data. These generally encourage words that are, include words like a, am, the, of, is, are, and all the words that really don't add meaning to a sentence, but they're in there so that we can speak. So we pull those out of our uh, document, so we're only analyzing the kind of important meaning words. So basically, uh, any of those words that are part of speech but do not provide insight. Uh, cinnamon, synonyms have the same uh, meaning in text mining as they do in English and are words that are different but mean the same thing like film and movie. Uh, polysemes, also known as homonyms, are words that are spelled the same but have a different meaning like bow for the front of a boat, bow for shooting arrows, or a bow to tie on a present. A token is a block of text that is categorized uh, according to its function. And tokenize, or tokenizing is the assignment of meaning to these blocks. Uh, it can be any useful part of the text. So a term dictionary is a collection of terms specific to a narrow field used to restrict the extracted terms. Word frequency is the number of times a word is found in a specific document. The part of speech tagging refers to the process of 
marking up the words in a text to a part of speech, such as nouns, verbs, adjectives, or adverbs, based on definition and context. Uh, morphology is the branch of linguistics and a part of natural language processing that looks at the internal structure of words, a term by document matrix or occurrence matrix as a representation of frequency-based relationship terms and documents where terms are listed in rows, documents are listed in columns, and the frequency is provided uh, in integers. So uh, second, we'll talk about how we take our raw unstructured text, we turn it into a corpus, that we then turn into the TDM or term document matrix, which is what we can pull into whatever software we're using to analyze, and that's uh, how we can start analyzing the text. Uh, let's see, TDM. So there's different ways that we can take um, that TDM. We can use singular value decomposition or latent semantic indexing, both of which are dimensionality reduction methods that transform the term by document matrix to a manageable size. So basically what happens um, is you have this matrix with a bunch of zeros and ones. It's very sparse, and those two methods can make the matrix smaller, so it's easier to analyze. Um, let's see, it's similar to principal component analysis, but that's a higher level uh, research term. Okay, so these definitions should give us some basis for learning more about text mining, uh, started with uh, the natural language processing. So <clears throat> there's two methods we're going to talk about. Um, the first one is a method of structure, or there, there are methods of structure and collection of text. So the bag of words is a uh, simplistic way to organize text into structures that classify them into natural groupings. Basically, it literally is just like a bag of words. We don't have any meaning attached to it. We break down a sentence and we just have those words. So uh, it's probably more in like spam filtering. Um, uh, you, the spam filter looks for just, you know, if this word occurs in here, such as Viagra, which is probably most uh, common spam word. It dumps it in your spam folder, but it's just based on one word with no real meaning. Uh, a newer approach is called uh, natural language processing, or NLP. Um, and it, it, it goes above that, and it has uh, it gives meanings to those words or phrases so that it can do a better job at identifying the text or mining information from it. So this is a question I ask myself all the time as a professor. What is understanding, and how do I know if students really understand a concept or a process? What do you think, Dr. Megan? Sorry, I was distracted. <laughs> There's no cats on this picture. I know. I was like, where's the cat? <laughs> ask me again, please. I was saying the, the concept of what is understanding like, how oh, do we define how we know? You're asking my anthropology knowledge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's something that you have the ability to pass on, hmm. like culture. Okay. That's an interesting definition. Well, so humans understand or understand concepts, but how are we going to, I guess, parlay that into what computers can do? So this becomes more complicated with computers because computers can learn, but they can never really understand, right? So also speech and, and written language are constantly evolving the way we uh, communicate uh, our different backgrounds, our different patterns of speech because of education, uh, community, and so forth. It makes it hard to keep uh, uh, these, these kinds of understandings going, especially from a computer standpoint where it has to constantly be updated. Uh, for example, someone taught English in a foreign country usually writes and speaks English very formally. So this begs the question if a computer will ever be able to fully understand natural language. So although natural language processing has come a long way since it began, there are still many challenges. Uh, it is difficult to mark up words with their part of speech, such as nouns, verbs, and so on. 
because that often depends on the definition of the term and the context in which it is used. <clears throat> and many written languages, such as Mandarin, Japanese, Thai, don't have single word boundaries. So like a, a Mandarin character can have more than one meaning attached to it, or a means of phrase instead of just a word. So how do you, how would these uh, same concepts apply to other languages? Uh, it just presents a very large challenge. So this can also happen when analyzing uh, spoken language as words can blend into one another. Many words have more than one meaning and discovering the meaning can only be determined by looking at the context, which is difficult to teach a computer to do. Also, many sentence structures can vary from one person to another, but still mean the same thing. And teaching a computer to look for these various syntaxes is also difficult. I'm not sure you're all noticing ability to spell or use the proper spelling of their or your is going away from our culture. So teaching a computer to recognize regional differences, such as y'all. Is there anybody from the north? What happened when you heard the term y'all? Is that something they use up there? I didn't think so. <laughs> when I was in uh, Italy, I was talking to an Italian language uh, teacher. And uh, one of the conjugations of their verbs is you all. And I was like, y'all. <laughs> and she was, y'all? So, but I guess it depends on where you grow up. You guys? <laughs> Anyhow, so uh, typos and grammatical errors uh, also present challenges. Uh, a computer also has a difficult time recognizing speech that requires an action. So speech act, uh, can you pass the salt, requires someone to do something, right? Uh, and no verbal response is required versus can you pass the class, which generally requires only a yes or no answer. Although students often give a long explanation about this process, the AI community actually has many algorithms that already read and get knowledge from text and speech but I really don't think it can ever perfect uh, speech uh, and text because it's fluid. No two examples ever being the same, except for students who copy assignments. Okay, so WordNet is a database of English words along with their definitions, synonyms, and other relationships between those words. It is a great uh, kind of dictionary for NLP but it's expensive to build and maintain. Um, the book only talks about WordNet, but there's uh, several. Harvard was the one I usually used, and then there's other uh, kind of dictionaries out there when you're running uh, NLP type analysis. Uh, next, uh, sentiment analysis is probably one of the more popular text analytics methods. It is used to detect uh, favorable or unfavorable opinions about products and services. So you get a valence of negative or positive towards some particular um, item or from some phrase. <clears throat> so NLP tasks, uh, categories, natural language processing has many tasks associated with it. It can be simple like information retrieval or extraction or recognition of a named entity or something more complicated. Uh, question answering is when it automatically answers a question posed in natural language, like those chat bots that you have to deal with with customer service before they'll ever give you a real person. Like it'll say, my name's Chelsea and I'm here to help, but you know, Chelsea's not real. Anyhow, uh, if it understands the syntax of speech, uh, you know, despite the picture being there, Chelsea's not really sitting there because once you finally do get a real person, it's never Chelsea. Uh, another task is to automatically generate a summary of a longer document, like computer-generated cliff notes. Another task is the ability to convert information and databases to readable languages, or it can transform human language to more formal methods that are easier for a computer to analyze. Uh, natural language processing also translates one language to another, or can provide foreign language reading or writing, kind of like what uh, Google Translate can do but uh, it tends to have a lot of errors that if a human were to translate it, they would uh, could translate it properly. 
natural language processing can also can convert spoken text to written text or convert written text to spoken language through speech uh, synthesis. Uh, like new textbooks can be read to you and listened to from your phone, no reading required. This is also the process that word processing programs use to correct spelling and grammar mistakes, sometimes correctly and sometimes not. But like any program or any person, it has flaws, but overall it is very useful type of analysis that we will use for many of our everyday tasks. So text mining applications. Um, text mining is used in so many fields it would be difficult to describe them all. Uh, spoken and written words are how humans communicate, so it makes sense that this field would be very broad. Uh, in marketing, calls to call centers are monitored and analyzed to allow the computer to know when upselling or cross-selling would be most effective and prompt the employee to suggest the right products and services. And that's why they have, you know, the uh, you know, they preface. This call, may, this call may be recorded for quality assurance purposes, but what they're really doing is that looking for ways to upsell you. Uh, it's also used for analysis of customer reviews online to determine improvements that can be made to improve customer satisfaction. It also creates a product description automatically that is designed to appeal to what people want from the product to highlight the attributes. Uh, the ways marketing uses text now is vast. I'm pretty sure marketing is probably one of the biggest uh, users of text mining. Uh, security uses uh, text analytics to identify intercept calls, faxes, and emails to determine threats to national or international security. It can also be used as a lie detector by identifying statements uh, most commonly associated with lies to, to, to uh, detect criminal activity, no input needed from police. Uh, text mining is used in medicine to search literature to find a likely diagnosis based on um, symptoms has been a source of information for the Human Genome Project. Uh, academia is used to identify research that is of interest and has become a type of research among itself as it identifies common themes and research and trends over time. So the text mining process, basically we have, um, uh, it needs to be built on best practices. But this diagram shows how knowledge and information is gained from text. So both uh, unstructured data and structured data uh, come in and can be allotted with considerations uh, for software and hardware limitations, privacy issues, linguistic limitations, and domain expertise and tools and techniques to generate context uh, specific knowledge. So like I was saying earlier, um, the text mining process, we take our unstructured data uh, we establish the corpus. We can then turn that corpus into our term document matrix, which is a uh, matrix that we can perform you know, mathematical operations on. And we pull that in, and we can extract knowledge that we then interpret to. So is the document matrix, is that like a, a dictionary you put in if you're looking for specific terminology or something like that? No, no. Um, you, you'll run it against a dictionary. Um, I don't think we're going to do that in this class because that gets a lot higher. I do that in my doctoral <laughs> level class in Python. But uh, yeah. you know, the, uh, the document, so basically the steps are we have like a block of text. We take out all the useless words, and then we put that in, um, in this matrix. And for each row is a document, or let's say a sentence, and we put the words that are in it, and then each column you know, represents a word. So we end up with this really large, uh, very sparse matrix. And that's uh, the matrix is really just a representation of the text with frequencies for words. OK, that, that's a little beyond what I did. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but then, yeah, then we can take that and uh, we can match it up against a dictionary and we can do sentiment analysis and uh, we have to get it to that. That's kind of like our working data frame that we can, we can do the analysis from. So establish the corpus. Um, it can come from, like I said, anywhere, text documents, emails, uh, web pages. You can digitize voice recordings. Um, 
and place the collection uh, in a common place, so like a folder or some or a directory where all the documents are stored, and then we can pull them into a corpus. So here's kind of what the like what I was saying. We create the term by document matrix or TDM. We have the rows which regiment uh, like documents, and here we have actually bigrams. So there's two words, and each column represents how many times uh, well, a cell represents how many times in that document this phrase came up. So you can see this is very small, but it can be very large, and there's a lot of emptiness in that matrix. So to create the, um, the term document matrix, we need to determine if all the terms should be included. For example, we probably won't include words like of and the, and thus we have to use remove all the stop words. Um, we also need to outline synonyms, homonym, and stems, and then determine what the best representation of the indices are. Um, so how do we represent those values in the cells? Is it going to be, you know, just counts? Is it going to be, do we have to manipulate it somehow? Uh, inverse document frequency, um, I don't think we do that in this assignment, but. Uh, let's see. So a term by document matrix is usually large and sparse with most cells filled with zeros. And as such, there are methods to reduce dimensionality of the data. First, a domain expert can go through the list of terms and remove those that don't make sense for the context of the study. But as it is done manually, it can be time consuming and expensive in terms of labor. However, uh, at Virginia Tech, you know what we did? We had very large, you know, 300 uh, student classes, and the professor that taught the text mining then could uh, recruit his students for extra credit to go through and tag all these words. And as a as a PhD student, I actually got forced into some of that because he he taught a, a seminar class. He wasn't really my favorite professor. Let's see. So, anyway, it's um. They can also eliminate the terms with very few occurrences and very few documents, as they are unlikely to yield new discoveries. Another option is to use more automated techniques like singular value, value decomposition. Um, and so final part is to extract patterns or knowledge. <clears throat> we can use uh, classification techniques uh, or clustering. Uh, classification is the most common and is also uh, used to place the terms and categories, which can then be analyzed by a knowledge expert, a person with lots of expertise in the area, which is sometimes hard to find. So it's shifting to more uh, automated techniques, like I was saying. Uh, we can also use it for clustering, which uses pre-classified training examples to classify new examples. It is used for improved search recall and precision. Scatter gather, which creates a sort of table of contents from browsing or a query-specific cluster, which employs a hierarchical approach. The last um, one is association or association mining, which we will just discuss more next week when we talk about uh, uh, regular data mining. It discovers relationships between variables and large uh, databases. Uh, we can also use um, trend analysis to identify key concepts and how they are trending over time. So. There are many uh, softwares that exist that can do text mining, um, including commercially available products like SPSS, SAS, Statistical Data Miner, and Clear Forest. Uh, these all have advantages, but they all share some, well, the main disadvantage. They all cost money, especially SPSS and SAS. I don't know as much about the other two. Uh, so that I help you as students save money. We will only use programs that are free in my class. So we're going to learn uh, rapid miner next week for data mining, and we're going to use R for text mining. In fact, we're going to use R most of the classes I teach. Python's also free. You notice your textbook is free, too. That's the bonus, right? <laughs> Okay, so next thing we'll talk about is sentiment analysis. Um, I'll just talk about it real quick. Uh, human beings are social and use many ways to communicate. 
we may look at forums before making a financial decision, like on Google or um, or Amazon reviews. We ask for recommendations on where to eat from friends or online reviews, like Yelp or whatever is out there now, mostly Google reviews. Uh, and then we also get online medical advice. With these sort of human interactions at our fingertips, our communication channels have increased. Sentiment is often used for the words, belief, view, opinion, or conviction, but it is more than that as it is unique in that it reflects feelings and text. So sentiment analysis is also called opinion mining, subjectivity analysis, and appraisal extraction, but all refers to the ability of a computer to recognize human emotion, the ultimate goal is to determine how people feel about a specific topic. It also needs to be able to identify explicitly uh, sentiment, something that I is directly said, I love this product, versus implicit sentiment, this product completes me. From there, we need to determine the polarity of the sentiment. Is it positive, how positive, or negative, how negative, or is it neutral? It's an example of a social media dashboard, which allows companies to track uh, con customer sentiment in real time. I'm sure you can all think of times when this is useful for companies to ensure they respond timely and appropriately. Like, uh, what was it, General Mills? Did you see when they found the uh, cinnamon-coated shrimp in the cereal? Oh, like a couple months ago, I think. Well, I'm sure. <laughs> They tried to catch it quickly on their, their social uh, media. Yeah, I'm gonna post it on like Twitter about it, posted a picture. Yes. Um, I won't go up to as much about sentiment analysis because we're only gonna do the uh, text mining part. Okay, let's see. So the next thing I wanna do Got some additional students. We got 15. Okay. So the next thing we need to do is uh, install R and R Studio. And R has to be installed first before you install R Studio, or it won't work correctly. So to do that, we're going to go to um, CRAN, the Comprehensive R ICAR Network. <coughs> and fortunately, you can. Put it on both uh, Macs and Windows. Still recommend using Windows, but so you go to download R for Windows and go to the install R for the first time, and it'll bring you to the most recent, you know, usable version of R. If you're using a uh, a lab computer, it's already there. Yeah. But uh, if you're continuing on in this program, you probably want to uh, have a laptop and install it on your laptop. So anyways, if you hit that and download it, it takes a little bit of time. Should I like update my version? Probably. <laughs> yeah, I hate updating it because that means previous code won't work because they'll put some change in there. But, uh, I don't think it's going to let me install it, but. Because I don't have admin rights. Cancel. I'm going to get in trouble. Anyways, so let that run, run it through the installer, and then let me know when you uh, have it, that part installed. I did it the other day and it gave me two I386 and X64. Um, yeah, on here, something like that. Yeah, we're never going to actually use R, like base R. We're going to only use R Studio, but you have to install R first okay. so that okay. when R Studio gets installed, it knows where R is already. All righty then, we'll leave it. <laughs> oh. There are some other slides that I was going to talk about, but I want to get to the end. Those are my grand cats. <laughs> this is Allergen. 
seems pretty old actually, and this is William. They both live uh, down in Sunrise, and this weekend I have to actually go drive down there to uh, help my daughter move from one apartment to another. I need to borrow one of the cats. The squirrel keeps getting in my bird feeder. Oh, no. <laughs> We're quite the opposite. We actually have squirrel feeders. Yeah, I'm getting one to keep him out. <laughs> I don't think it works. <laughs> no, we have two squirrel feeders because my wife likes to feed the squirrel. I actually made a comment that she spent $27 on squirrel food. Yeah. Well, I'm using the hot pepper food, and they're supposed to not like it. Huh. Yeah, I Dr. guess I've Davey? seen it. Yeah. Would you mind showing um, what to download again? I missed it. Okay, so if you go, I can get back to. I usually just Google CRAN, and then from here, depending on if you're using Linux, Mac, or Windows, you click on that, and then it'll say for Windows at least install R for the first time, and then download whatever the most recent one which is 4.1.1. Okay, thank you. Hopefully it goes as smoothly for Mac users, but I don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, if you you downloaded it in the spring last year, um, you probably don't need to re-download it right now. But if like in the future some code doesn't work that we're working on, then you may want to update R because, like I said, the code can be specific to an R version. So once you've downloaded that, you've gone through the whole installer and you've installed R, you probably have something like this on your desktop or somewhere, or if you type you know, R, um, it's going to bring up R Studio, so that's what we're about to install, but we'll never actually use base R. So the next thing you want to go and find is R Studio. And then... <clears throat> Chance. So let's see. Our products, I used to go straight to this page. Our Studio Desktop, Open Source Edition. Actually, I've changed the way this looks. Uh, so download the free one, Our Studio Desktop. Uh, I cannot show how to download for Mac. I, I can go here. Um, let's see. I think it depends on which version of your operating system you're using. I don't know. I have in previous classes, I've had problems with uh, people who use Macs <coughs> not being able to get it to work right. But um, some there's some way to identify which operating system you're using, and then just make sure you click, you download the correct one. Also, let's see, you might be able to. something like this where it tells you which one to use or install R and R Studio on Mac. Really can't be too much help because I never actually use a Mac. Yeah, you can use a virtual machine. Um, I don't know. 
Anyhow, so download RStudio Desktop. Uh, choose your version. This is the website it usually goes straight to and download. Hey, Professor, you said uh, our studio desktop, not server, right? Professor? Failed. Yeah, desktop. I only free one. Well, I guess studio, but, but uh, we're not going to use the server because that's probably beyond what we would ever use it for. Just the free R Studio desktop. And you want us to download all? all? Um, the all installer on the next page? Or is there, uh, wait, if you scroll down, it's. <laughs> Oh, is it just that one? It says all installers or zip installer or just everything? I would just click up here, download yeah. RStudio for Windows, and it'll, it should give you the correct one. Um, or if you're using Windows 10 or Mac uh, or several different versions of uh, Linux. So after that, you should open up our studio and it should look like that. <clears throat> so you guys online, can you just put something in the chat box once you have everything installed so I know that I can uh, keep going? There's a bunch of stuff in two of my screens. What do you mean? Uh, like in the, I have R 4.1.1 and it's giving me a lot of information. And then there's a bunch Here? of uh, folders under files. Is that just going at my folders? Oh, like here. Oh, I usually yeah. have it on. I usually leave it on plots because okay. all the plots will come in. And then over uh, here, um, it's just telling me what version it is and all that stuff. Yeah, if you hit Control L, it'll clear, it'll clear that out. Thank you. This is what it looks like when uh, usually when somebody first installs it. After you start using it, it never looks like this again. Good to go. How about everybody in class? Everybody got it? All set? Anybody not want me to continue yet? Uh, give me a little bit. I'm still getting R Studio downloaded. All right. I don't want to leave anybody behind because uh, this is going to be very uh, important to every other class that we do.
how they are. So when you first open it up, it should you should have three screens like this. Now your environment, and then I don't know if files or whatever here. I usually put it on thoughts, and then you'll have your console. And uh, if you had just opened up one of these um, one of these terminals, uh, that these terminals are the exact same thing as what's here. It's just the console that we're sending all the code through. Did you open R Studio or R? Yeah, um, <laughs> it, it looks like uh, a, it looks like just a old school notepad thing, like unlike yours that has really nice like um, de decals and stuff at the top. Mine have older ones. I don't know if it's because it's called my computer. It's like, like this. Yeah, that that's that's the one. Right. So that's our that's the base R program. So we don't want to run that. You want to run R Studio. I don't know. Try R Studio. I think I see it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Everybody caught up now? Let's move on then. So we have R Studio. Let's see. So I'll go over a, a basic introduction to R. Um, so you have the R Studio console. We'll get this screen up here. This is generally what it's going to look like. You'll have your script up here, the console on the lower left. Uh, your environment is in the upper right, and your plots or packages or uh, files is in the lower right. So to create a script, you go to that green plus sign uh, just up below file and select R script. Go up here, you go here, hit R script, and you'll get that fourth box. How do you add console? What do you mean? Okay. So now we have the uh, basic look. You still only have three boxes. Yeah, it doesn't have the fourth box. That's why I I, uh, I deleted the script for now. But uh, you go up here and you add an R script. And that creates the fourth box. And then you should have four. So um, in R, we can do a lot of things. You know, use it like a calculator. But uh, you'll need to know these basic um, functions, what they look like. Plus sign, minus sign. The asterisk is for multiplication. Uh, the slash is for division. Uh, this little caret is uh, the exponent. And then for square root, you have to type out square root with parentheses, because the square root is actually a function. So can run through some quick examples. Um, if you type this down in the console, 125 minus 3, 
if I can make this a bigger. Okay. So edit, you hit enter, it'll evaluate in the console. 125 minus 3 is 122. <clears throat> How do you clear the console? It's Control L. Now I'll get it, all that beginner text. Alternatively, up here, if we type the same uh, expression in the script, and you can highlight it and you hit Run, what it does is it sends whatever code you highlight up here down into the console and it runs it. Because um, if we do hit Control L, you'll see that. It's gone. It should be up here in your history, but it only runs uh, the, what you've sent into the console, and not necessarily the results. <clears throat> so that's kind of the importance of using scripts. Is uh, it, it keeps track of all your code. Um, the old school way would have been to use that, that uh, console, or just the, the console. And you would have had a text file, and you would have typed it, and you would have run it through the, the console. But this makes things so much easier, especially because when we generate plots, uh, they come out down here. And uh, it's just so much better to use a, a development environment like RStudio. OK, so what other examples? OK, so how to use a function like square root, square root of 543. run it, whatever the function is, put the parentheses, it'll form that function on whatever data you put in the parentheses. Uh, so it also does the order of operations. I'll go up here and type that one in. So six times three plus 14. Minus nine divided by four raised to the second. Okay, so there's several types of data that we can use in R, including logical, which are binary variables, 0, 1, true, false, on, off, any uh, way you want to look at it. Integer type data, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, they're basically whole numbers. Uh, numeric type can be decibels. And then character, uh, you always have to put character data in uh, quotations, but go ahead and read it. Like hello. Yeah. So to get the, the script or get this fourth block up here, it's up here in the R script. Uh, uh, another important thing we're going to be working with over the next. Uh, well, nine months or so, is uh, vectors and matrices and data frames. So we'll go over kind of what those each mean. So uh, a vector, um, we'll start with what a scalar is. It's a vector of length one. So you can assign this variable uh, y with the assigning function here, 500. So you'll see, let's see, there you go. y, our assign function, 500. And what it does is it assigns value 500 to our variable y. And then it will store it over in this global environment over here. So anytime you've uh, created variables, you'll know if it's over here because it'll say the values y is 500, or it can be a vector, which we'll do in a second. It'll also show any data frames that you're working with. It will show up over in the, the global environment. So, um, 
the next is to make, let's assign a numeric vector x. We're going to use this c function, and it's going to combine those four terms into a vector. So x, uh, c, b, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we've created an x variable. It's a numeric vector, length 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, or the value in that vector. Now, if you were down in the console and it hit y, it would return the variable or the, the value we assigned to y. If we hit x, it will return our uh, vector. Hi, Dr. Davis, I forget, is R case sensitive? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. If you used lowercase y and lowercase x, or you used uppercase y and uppercase x, or whatever, or you misspell something, um, yeah, R will not be happy. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, that's why generally in my upper level classes when we start working with variables, you don't want to import, you know, number of patients as your variable name because first of all, you don't want to type that every time and if you mistype it and you have some long block of code, it will uh, it will not work. So I would, be, I would shorten it to like PAT or something. I usually like uh, three letter <coughs> variables when I'm dealing with big sets of real data. Anyhow, so what's the next uh, character vector? Call it Z, and we'll make it hello world. So we'll find that. So Z is the variable, it's a character vector, it's length 2, it contains hello world. Hit Z, return hello world. So those are the different kinds of vectors that we work with in R. So other types of data are matrix or matrices. So the kind of the difference between these are matrices are two-dimensional structures for storing values of the same type. So a matrix would be all integers or all characters, etc. A list uh, is a multi-dimensional structure for storing values of any data type. So it's a list. You kind of uh, combine those two and you get something called a data frame, which is what the majority of what we're going to work with is going to be. It's a two-dimensional structure that can store any data type or object. Um, next thing is functions. So we already did the square root function. Uh, there's several other functions, like we can do mean. Let's see. Let's say I wanted to do mean of x. It'll run the mean on that uh, vector of numbers. Let's see, we can also use this uh, sequence function. I'm going to overwrite z sequence. So we had a character vector z. Now we've overwritten it. So z is now a numeric vector, length 5 of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now I could do mean z. And it will run it based on this new uh, vector.
sometimes uh, there'll be functions that don't exist in R, and we have to write them ourselves. Uh, one such function is uh, get mode. Another thing you should probably learn about is commenting. You use the hashtag or the pound sign. It creates a comment. We'll say create mode function. Uh, we're going to call it get mode. So we're going to assign this function to it. So we're going to use the function function. So we're going to put kind of a placeholder in there. Use the brace. Then we're going to put what's going to be in that, that get mode function. So do unique v is the unique function. run this block of code and now you'll have functions get mode and then the function let's see if this works let's say z <coughs> New Z. Do get mode Z. Let's see if it works. So it now finds the mode, and now you wrote the function that tells R how to do it. This may be important in a future class when you have to find a mode for something. The next thing you need to do is to save your R script and your work, R workspace. Now, um, in this class and pretty much all the classes from here on that use R, you're going to want to save up here your R script. Save it as uh, intro. So this saves just this script area. Now, in order for me to recreate your code, I'll need that file, but I'll also need you to save your environment or your workspace, so it'll give me like the get mode function. So save that as intro space. So that'll be an, a .r data file, and the other one will be a .r file. And those two files combined let me recreate everything that you've done. So when 
you're doing a bigger project, and you'll send me your R script and your .R data file. I will run it through my R, and it will produce the same results that you should see or that you've seen on your computer. You'll be amazed at how people cannot save R files in the future. Please don't be that stupid. A little floppy, a little floppy under environment. Those are the two. So, like I said, it makes your work reproducible. Okay, it's probably a good time for a break before we start the assignment. It's a little early. You guys didn't have as many problems installing R as basically every other class I've had. So great, great job. Everybody doing all right online? You guys were already on the break. Okay. Hey, Professor, on, on mine, when I was typing that last code, the Git mode, I'm getting a error unexpected in the bottom. Down here? Yes. So, okay, so make sure everything is typed exactly here. Because if you have any misspellings or case changes, um, <coughs> It won't. The code won't work. Yeah, I got an error. Error because function was spelled wrong. So uh, go back and count all the parentheses and all the braces and all yeah. the brackets. That's what I did at the end of when I was typing it up because I was like, man, there's so many parentheses. Well, let's take a 10 minute break and then uh, we'll come back and we'll start working on the assignment. I'll leave this up here in case anybody needs to double check their mode function. I got charged my computer.
Okay, so we will take a look at the assignment um, and the weekly folder. It's week four, halfway there. Uh, we need to download the assignment and the um, start with this text. Fortunately, Blackboard does not um, download text files. So you'll want to create a new um, text document. Oh, I already have one. I've done this before. Anyhow, and then uh, paste it in there and save it. Oh, you could have emailed me and I could have told you. Mine downloaded fine as a text file. <laughs> you must have a better computer. Or, I, I don't know what I did to make it happen. <laughs> I've tried different things. Uh, I mean, I don't know why it will not just download it. But yeah, it's a pain. Uh, then, of course, download the assignment file, which should pop up like this. It says there's another text file here. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's going to be, so we'll go around to do the I have dream speech together, and then you guys will modify the code to work with the new text. No. So you'll have to do both. So I'll take a look. Um, We're going to complete this text mining tutorial, and then you're going to complete the same steps on the Hunger Games text. You will print your R console work to a PDF. So basically, whatever is in your console, we're going to <coughs> copy it to a Word file and save as PDF. I'll get to that step when we get there. Um, let's see, you'll save your Word cloud and frequency chart to um, a Word document and explain what you see. And then you'll complete a one-page paper on text mining, give specific examples of how text mining can be used in business. We talked a little bit about marketing, but you can go on Google and see how the world is using text mining. Uh, and then answer what kind of predictions can you make? How could it help you do uh, prescriptive analytics? And uh, so that's kind of the, the components of the assignment. Uh, so you'll submit your PDF and your Word document with your um, Word Clouds frequency charts and one page paper. You can see that the paper is worth significantly more than the uh, printouts. So you're going to recreate this uh, Word Cloud. Uh, it's a nice, easy way to get into R because you get a visualization out of it. A lot of your future work is going to be all analysis. So that's a good way to kind of see, have something uh, shown at the end of your, your work. Yeah, so download the Hunger Games text also because you're going to work with it after we get through this tutorial. Um, so for this particular assignment, um, the instructions say to copy the console work. So once you've run your script through here, um, copy what is in the console 
into a Word document and then save it as a PDF. And then in your one page paper, you'll talk about your uh, charts and frequency and how text mining can be useful to businesses. <clears throat> Um, basically, we're going to work through this text, uh, this file. So the first thing we need to do, uh, well, first thing we ought to do <clears throat> is clean up this big mess. Uh, so we can either open a new script, or you can delete everything out of that one. You want to hit the little sweep here <clears throat> and clear out any functions or already assigned variables. <clears throat> so it's always good to start with a. Uh, Clean console. Hey, professor, how'd you clean the? Um, oh, did you just you just open a new one. Okay, never mind. Thanks. Yeah. So you can open a new one, or you can delete everything there, whatever you want to do. So, we've got a new script, clean environment, no plots right now, but your work lab will uh, populate down here once we get there. Uh, how to clean the environment. That's um, this little brush up here. Okay. So generally at the beginning of any script, uh, you're going to put your libraries that you're going to work with. So if you copy all these install.packages, and we'll paste them in our top of our script. You only have to install packages once. So after they're installed, you don't have to reinstall them. You just open the library that's already installed. Now when we run these, I had to add this last one because when I reran the, uh, the assignment this morning, apparently in an update, uh, they've changed the R, C++ library. So. Installing libraries will take a little bit. You'll know it's still going because it'll say stop. But don't hit the stop sign because that'll mess it up. So then the stop sign will go away and you'll get back to a, an open console. So now that all those packages are installed, uh, I would comment them out so you don't accidentally rerun them. Because if you rerun them, it'll try to reinstall them and you'll waste two minutes of your life. Hey, Professor, in the, in the top when you start to install, what, what do you type mm -hmm. to get it to start running? Um, well, basically, you highlight and you hit run. OK, so after I type the first command in the block one, it'll bring up two, three, four, five, and six? Yeah, so after you highlight and hit run, yeah, it'll, it'll install this package first, and that one, that one, that one, et cetera. OK. And then you'll want to comment it out in case. So the second part, once those packages are installed, is you want to load all the libraries we're going to be working with. Copy. 
that into your script. And you'll do the same thing. You run it, and it will go through and open up each of those libraries. So now we have access to all the functions in those libraries, and we just call the function. Still loading. OK. Yeah, depending on their internet connection or the server that you're closest to, sometimes it takes a while for. Yeah, don't do anything on your computer until the stop sign goes away. Well, it's not in our. Once your uh, your libraries are open, then we'll want to read in the text. So there's different code here, but the I've added this one in because we're going to do something called file.choose, and that way we can pull the the uh, text file that we downloaded. Put a little comment here and say read data. What it should do when you run this code, <clears throat> so we get a little dialog box so on the desktop. I'll select um, where we put that text file, and it will read it in to our environment. What did you do then? Oh, so we highlight, we hit run, and then you get a dialog box. Let's see if I can make it do it again. So then, then you select whatever, wherever you saved it, and then it'll put it here. This is done. So now we got our data in here. Um, there's different ways to pull in data. You can also do it from over here, but I really like the file.choose method because you can always find your data. Hey, Professor. Um, I, I, I tried to run the file.choose and it still it didn't. Maybe I, maybe, I, maybe I was trying to type it while you, um, while you did it. How did you add it to the values? So when you run it, uh -huh. you should get a dialog box. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And then you select. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you select frame. And you hit open. And it will. I'm going to give me an error because I've already done it. Uh, so it's wherever I saved it, the that text file we downloaded <coughs> earlier onto my desktop. But if you put it in your downloads or wherever you wherever you put the file. NLP. It should be all right. I think the if we get down to when we start running the functions and you get errors, then we'll know that the library didn't open up. But I mean, they all installed, right? Oh, 
What kind of computer are you using? Surface Pro. I don't know. Um, you can try to follow that and get, go install our tools. I don't know. It's not an error I've run into in a long time. So you may have to install our tools. <coughs> I didn't have to do that on mine, so it just may be the kind of computer that you're using. Definitely that cracks the air. Okay, so now hopefully you've got this data in here. So next thing, remember we talked about earlier in the lecture, we've got this data file, it's unstructured. We want to turn it into a corpus. So that's what we're going to do in the next set of code. Start, it in, start getting it into something we can analyze. Turn it into text, into data, and you'll see that when you click on it, you can view whatever that data is. In this instance, because of the, the structure of the data, it's not as intuitive as what we'll do when we pull in like Excel data. But if we actually want to look at the data, we can do inspect. see that it broke it down into 45 lines. Um, let me see. If you get um, an error, could not find function corpus, that means whatever library corpus is in is not loaded. So go back up first, make sure, hopefully it installed when you did the install out packages, and then try reloading these libraries. You hit run, it'll reload the libraries, and hopefully that error will go away. I don't remember which um, library that, that's in, but it's in one of these. <coughs> so basically, anytime you get an error that looks like this, uh, error in whatever could not find function, you just need to look up where this function is located. Sometimes you can you know, Google our corpus or whatever, and it'll tell you the which library it's in, and then you just do library, whatever. It's probably in one of these text mining ones, probably TM, which is the text mining. So uh, the next thing we're going to do is start to clean the data. Uh, we have to remove uh, all the spaces uh, and you know arbitrary characters like slash and at sign. So basically that's what we're going to do is we're going to remove, well, we're going to remove those symbols and uh, replace it with space. Is what I mean. Don't think there's too much of that in, uh, in our data, so there won't be too much difference if you were to re-inspect the data.
Next, we're going to start um, cleaning all the text. So we talked about the, um, the removal of stop words. We're going to use um, an English dictionary that's going to remove um, numbers, but basically anything, punctuation, uh, excess white space. And then it's going to uh, remove, well, it's going to transform all the words into their stems so we can count, you know, steep, steeping, steeper, whatever, as one term instead of three separate terms. I'm just going to run this just to demonstrate. You can see how the, how the text has changed from uh, the original. We removed everything's been uh, is transformed to lowercase because it would be case sensitive. So uppercase and lowercase would be counted separate. We removed um, uh, all the, the stop words and uh, articles like the and an. So it's getting closer to being able to be analyzed. So the next step is to build a term document matrix. Hey, uh, Doc, real quick before you move forward, did you mm -hmm. type in inspect on in? Yeah, that, that's, I was just trying to demonstrate how the text had changed based on the code that we'd run. Oh, okay. So you don't have to run that code if you don't want to. Okay. It'll, it'll generate this. You can if you want to. I mean, no big deal. <clears throat> so we're going to use um, the term document matrix function is going to turn our basically our the corpus that we've you know cleaned up into a DTM that we can then uh, we'll turn into a matrix and we can start analyzing. So got this first part. So the head function gives us the, it's going to give us the first 20 um, entries into that. You can also use the tail function, which would give you the last 20 if you switch that to tail. <coughs> which will give you the word and its frequency. The next set of code will generate the word cloud. The word cloud should come up here if you have plots up. see that the size of the word indicates how many times it has been um, found. So you can see will 17 times, so will should be the biggest. Freedom is the next biggest.
Mine doesn't match either because it should. When I ran it this morning, it looked like this on my computer. Okay, so um, you can go a little further and you can find the frequency of the terms and correlations between the terms. Yeah, somebody else said they have a lot of white space too. As long as the we generated a a plot um, or a word cloud. You can find uh, frequencies and terms. Uh, low frequency equals four. Uh, occurs at least four times. See what happens if you look at uh, frequency of five. And then the next set is if you want to find terms that are correlated with freedom, we can find association. Obviously, when you do um, the Hunger Games text, you're not going to be looking for freedom. You probably want to pick a more a term that fits better with uh, that text. So it'll give you the correlations between words and that word. Now, that's the relation between frequent terms. Um, look at. Another association with the word dream. So we have um, this head function looks at the top 10 words, but we can create a bar plot with this section. So then you'll want to open up um, two new Word files, blank document, and then here you hit control. Copy everything here, control, control C, and paste that. text. That way I can see it. So then you'll have <coughs> that set. Um, once you uh, modify your code for the Hunger Games text, then you'll want to save this file as different my computer. Go download. You'll go here and you can change it to PDF. Then it generates a PDF. All right, so about that. So go back to the top. So that's part one. I want another Word document. <coughs> and you'll want to go here, and you can go export. Copy to clipboard. Paste. Oh, so I Why didn't I copy it? Copy plot. Paste. There. <coughs> so 
I copy that plot. And then you hit this arrow and you can go back to your word cloud. Export. Copy. Clipboard. Copy. Copy. That's for the I have a dream speech. Hey, Professor, could you show me how you exported both of those one more time? Yeah. So, so as I look at both of them, you have these arrows up here. You would export, copy to clipboard, and then copy plot, and then you can paste it in a Word document. Gotcha. You I didn't know you could go back and forth, so that's good to know. Yeah, no, this is important because uh, some eventually we'll look at multiple visualizations and we'll want be able to want to go through them. Um, so export, copy to clipboard. Oh, from here? Oh. So I just highlighted all the way. And then hit Control C, and then et cetera. Control B in the Word document. Hey, Professor, um, do you care if uh, the visuals are PDF or not, or can we just save them as Word when we upload? Does that matter? Um, if you want to save them in the, the PDF with the source code and keep your essay in another, that's fine. Okay. You may want to um, keep them, though, in the Word document because you'll want to uh, explain what you see. Gotcha. So. But it's really up to you. So then the second part of the assignment is to download the Hunger Games text uh, and do that part. So you'll have to read the text in. You'll have to modify some of the code a little bit. Not too much, though. Anybody have a hand up? Um, I do not think the computer is on the library. This classroom has them, and the one next to it, I can't remember what that classroom is, but no, I had to request to have basically any classroom I teach in have it uh, downloaded onto that computer. Hey, uh, Doc, you said you're going to save this as a PDF or a text. So the, the console code, save it as a PDF. Let's see. So when you copy all this, you control C and paste it into a Word document and then save the Word document as a .pdf. Hey, Professor, if I clear the environment, does that mean I have to reinstall packages and library, the library? Or is that uh, already? 
it'll erase everything in the console. So for our purposes, it would do that, but um, I don't think you'll need to reinstall. If you've cleared out the console, then just rerun the code from the loading area. Okay. Gotcha. It's coming. I do believe PDFs, you cannot change the author. So students that don't actually do the assignment and just change the name, that's why I'm supposed to design that particular way. Not that I think any of you guys would do that. Are we turning in this one too, or do you just want the? Yeah, both sets. So <coughs> both okay. sets showing you follow along with this, and then how you modified it to fit the new data. Um, so the plot and the word cloud, since you're going to be describing them, I suggest you put it in where you put your one page essay. But um, like I said, if you want to put it in the PDF, it doesn't really matter. Here, you know, you can move across them, you know, export, copy to clipboard, and copy plot, and then you can paste it from there. <coughs> so I expected this to take longer. Like I said, generally it takes like an hour to get everybody to install R. Maybe R has gotten easier to install on them. Hey, Professor, I, I um, inspected the doc, and it looks like it has page numbers or something. Is this going to get rid of the page numbers, too? Uh, when you clean the data, let's see where it is. You should. I wasn't sure. If, I didn't see when we were going through. You should uh, remove numbers. Oh, nice. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Hypothetically, it should remove the numbers. Yes, sir. I inspected it after uh, it went through that remove numbers piece, and it had it didn't remove the numbers. So I don't know. So said that. I see. Yeah, like I just finished step three, and I'm on to step four, and it still has the. I, I'm looking at the bottom. I have nine hundred ninety-six, nine ninety-seven. Oh. Those could be the rows, I guess. Maybe those are the rows. 
or the like line items, I guess. Is it on the left, like? Yeah, it's left in brackets. The close to the close uh, bracket. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the, the line number. That makes it. I was like, I don't know why why you could get a PDF or like a the like script of the Hunger Games book and it would have page numbers. So, all right, good. Thanks. <laughs> Hey, Professor, uh, how do I get the last 20? So head, head D20, but is it tail something else 20? Let's see. You would just change, like, head to tail, okay. and it runs the tail function. Oh, oh I, I put capital T. Maybe that's why I didn't. A professor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, from the from the beginning, I'm 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 kind of going all the way back because that's something I did wrong. When when I initially copying the file, the the word document or the is that saved as a word document on the desktop in the folder? No, a text file. I want to use Notepad. Or some way because it, it'll save it as a .txt file, which is what you need. Oh, okay. So I was supposed to open up Notepad. Okay. So once I once I put those in Notepad, the um, I'm looking at the uh, after I did the load the libraries, mm -hmm. then it's got okay. the text. So the, the text file that I'm uh, clicking on 17, that'll be those, the uh, the notepad files? Yeah. Okay. When you run that, yeah, it'll open up a little dialog box and you'll go and, and select it. Okay. Okay. 
So if you're using Word, it looks like you can save it as plain text.txt. Not found. We make D. So this is when you go back and so in your console, go back up to when this code was. Wrong. I got it. I know what I did wrong. It. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Visual. It's hard to know where your errors are coming from. Sometimes this, uh, the plot size is too small, you'll get an error when you try to run the code. So it'll give you an error saying there's not enough space basically to run, but I don't know why you would get. Um, Uh, that's about the only way I can make that give you an error. So if you go further up, did you have any yeah. problems with? No, that was it. It was just the box was too small. <laughs> it was it was this it, it equal panes, and it still said the box was too small. So just a heads up when people get to that one. <laughs> The weird thing is when I when I tried to export it, it was also small like that. So when you when I hit export, even there, it came out and it was still small when I tried to copy it. It was very weird. Hmm. I don't know why that would. Uh, try to make it bigger and make sure you run it with set seed because it creates a random if you change this it should change what the graphic looks like yeah so since it's using a, a, a random process when it creates this um, or like how it arranges the words, um, you have to do set.seed function, and that just tells the random number ge generator to use that exact random number, seed number. Is there a way to go in and um, build new seeds for that, the sets? No, no, no. That's just, that's basically, computers don't really use random numbers. They have uh, basically flags it and so when you tell the computer to run a random process and you want to repeat it you set the seed to tell it where to pick that random number from but uh, it's a it's a pre-built table when you got get into simulation in a couple of weeks i think week seven we'll do some we'll talk more about random number generators Professor, mm -hmm. um, 
So when we initially downloaded R and R Studio, um, for R Studio, it's forcing to download an earlier version than what we downloaded, um, but everything seems to work the same. Is that okay? Um, as long as everything's working. So when you downloaded R Studio, it wanted you to download an older version. Mm hmm It said that I guess based on the space on my computer, it would it could only do a 32-bit instead of the 64. Um, the 30. It just depends on the processor architecture of your computer. So it usually downloads both. Um. So the 32-bit would be the i386 and the 64-bit. I have both of those, but for the R Studio, it didn't. It downloaded a different version. Let me see. I never had that problem. So I clicked there and I went there and then I clicked download here and it, so I kept clicking that big blue box and then it wouldn't work. So I came back and it said to do, I clicked on where it says older version of RStudio if you are on a 32 bit system. Mm -hmm. So I clicked the hyperlink that says older version of RStudio up above a little bit right there okay and then it brought me here um, and based on kind of the parameters i chose one okay i i and i don't think it'll cause a problem because it's really in the background if it's going how it how r is going to access your processor and run it'll probably run a lot slower than a 64-bit okay I was able to do, I think everything, well, I'm not necessarily caught up, but everything that I was able to do mirrored what you did. So felt like it was okay, but um, I'll submit it either way. So yeah, I don't, I don't think it'll affect this particular assignment in the future when we start running really big um, algorithms like a random forest. Um, that takes a lot of computer space and it may just take your computer twice as long to run. Okay. All right. Um, well, I'll try to maybe clean it up a little before we get there, um, but I at least wanted to mention it for this yeah. assignment. I can take Are a look we... at it. And, okay. Uh, when you come. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, are we able to log off now, or did you want us to continue? Yeah, yeah, no. And stay on the phone. Okay. Once you've done done the uh, both parts of the assignment and you write the paper, that's all. If you want to do that here or at home. Yeah, I'm not going to hold you up here for that part. Okay. Or if you need to do group work, remember your project's due in four weeks. So. Huh. Right. All right. Thank you. No problem. Good night. <coughs> Too long?
Yeah, so you're going to run that again. Um, but they're going to pull in 100 in seconds. So, when they put the time to time, they get You don't want us to like, change specific words to change those two. You can choose like whatever I want. Yeah, yeah, no, you can choose whatever. Just okay. Dream and freedom have more to do with the, the speech than they do on our names text, so you want to change those. Hey, Professor. Um, yeah. I had a question. So uh, I, I finished the assignment and going back through the steps and everything, and I tried to copy everything that was in my, uh, my console, uh, but mm -hmm. it stopped. Like, it, yeah, I went to the very top of the scroll, and I'm I'm well under probably what I need. <laughs> it says like uh, 641, and I'm I'm assuming. Uh, comment out that the inspect, and then rerun it, and it should contain. It should be contained in one console link. Sorry. So which one am I doing? What do I do? So, where do I do that? And so towards the top, there was inspect. And that wastes a lot of your, your um, console. So if you just put a, a hashtag there, it'll when you run everything, it will show a convenient amount. So everything in here goes in the PDF. And I would put, your, you should have four charts, or two charts and two word clouds and a word document with one page. Yeah, when you're taking out like, Oh, up here in the in the script. No, mm -hmm. I don't need the script for now. This is just so that by writing it in the script, when you go to put the Hunger Games text in, it makes it easier for you to rerun it. Oh, you don't have to retype it. But if I didn't rerun it, it then I would just it have to be in the script, right? That I'm turning it. No, yeah, we're not turning. In this assignment only, are you not turning in the script? In the future. I will only want to look at your script and your your. Um, so it doesn't need to be in the console. What you've run from here? Yeah. Everything that's in here should show up in here when you run it. Yeah, but I did. I have to run it again. It was already in it. For the second, the Hunger Games text. Yeah. You'll have to run everything from here down. Okay, but the library and all that. No, no, no. The libraries are already open. That's what, okay. Yeah. Now, once you open the library, unless you use a function from another library that overmasks or masks it, that's the only time you'd have to reopen the library. So the load is just one time as well. Yeah. So that little block is the one time every time you open R, you'll have to reopen the library. But we, since they're already installed, you don't have to reinstall them because they're already installed. So we're going to have two more documents, one for each checkbox. So there's two. One. Right, so the copy of your console and the other is you have two word clouds, two frequency, Instagrams, and then one page paper. Probably you're only on one, like, word for both. Yeah, well, you, you want a PDF, the one in a word document. Okay, so which one do you want PDF? The, the console. Just to
So then she wants PDF, but one PDF for each type of problem. Like, oh, it's all in one. All in one round of that. Well, it's not. We need to spend somewhere like this, so I have to drink the next one. Is what her name is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Professor. Uh, me again with uh, all my the stuff cut off. So I was looking at my my script and, um, about line 38. I did an inspect docs, and that's pretty much what everything above line 38. So everything before, I don't know, step four, um, it's not showing on there because it won't let me scroll any higher on the console box. So right. Um, so if you don't run that code, that's why I said you should. Uh... Hashtag it out. Yeah, so I, I already did. That's what I'm saying. Is there a way for me to be able to get that stuff? Um, Do I have to just like restart? Uh, if you just copy, yeah, if you just copy you down, copy this stuff. it'll just rerun it. Okay. And it'll show up in the console. Right. I just wasn't sure if I could do that. Awesome. Thanks. Hey, Professor, I'm, um, I don't know if you got anybody in front of you. Or... I'm all right. OK, so <clears throat> I'm, I'm, um, I'm on number three. I did the inspect docs. And I don't really know what's supposed to, you know, what my screen is supposed to be looking like. I did highlight sure. the, the. So when you do inspect docs, you should get something that looks like this. Some brackets with the, it should be towards the bottom, right? Okay, so I got, I think, um, forty-five, and it's got "Thank God Almighty" is the last little thing I got right there. Yeah. What you got? Right. So, so what's next after that? So in the assignment, you will copy <clears throat> the the next code after that. What is it? Uh, so we're gonna copy this code here. Okay. So we're going to remove slash at and the pipe symbol if it was in there. So that's where this comes in. So once I put that in and run it, um, I'm going to do it again, but I've been getting a, a error message. It's saying warning message, INTMAP single corpus doc space and it's all in red yeah that's all right so i got the same thing it's just it's saying it's dropping that from the the document oh okay i thought i was, I was something was wrong so i stopped i didn't know what what else was be doing. Uh, it's just a warning in case that's not what you wanted to do so as, as i go down from from where you got um that code I just keep scrolling down until I come to another code. Yeah, so in the document, yeah, so you'll come down. And then the next code we're going to want to do is to convert to lowercase and remove stop words all the way down to uh, here. Okay. Let me white space. So that will go all the way down to remove words at the at the last end of that code. Yeah. So in here, down here to where you're removing and. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then step four, it's uh, this block of code where you turn it into a term document matrix. And as I'm doing this, running these codes, the, the red um, warning message is it just going to be like that because this one say. Um, we got yeah, so message if, if warnings. If it's just a warning, then it's not a big deal. In this instance, uh, if you get errors, 
or where it says error and something doesn't run, that's different. So like error and plot view, that's because when this plot window was too small, it wasn't going to produce the figure. Uh, hello, I, did you, first did you install that particular package here? And then you need to open that library with that code. Other than that, I don't know why it would be telling you to run it from a zip file. Um, do you have another inspection there at all? Or I don't know why it would have produced it. I mean, it's still running right now. So. Yeah, let it go, because otherwise it'll crash. And... So I'm getting error and map space like dot com now. You can do so, right click select all, but then it also copies this. Let's try this. There.
Professor, when we save it, we can save it into a Word document. Um, like in the so your plots, you would you'll export them. Let me go recreate that. So, so this you'll copy to clipboard and copy to plot and save that in a Word file. Um, here, if you select all. You copy it and then you paste it and then when you get into Word, you'll want to save as a PDF. Oh, okay, okay. For so if you look at the instructions, go back to the top. So you'll see, you print your R console to P to and save it as a PDF like I showed, and that is where um, this comes from. You can put both. Uh, I have a dream speech and the Hunger Games all in one long PDF. And then the word clouds and the frequency charts and the, the actual paper here, I think, makes most sense in the just a word document. Okay. Okay. So in, I'm, I got all the way to the end and I see the same stuff that you, the plots in the... Um, the word cloud? The, the, uh, the I have a dream um word cloud thing mm -hmm. so i after i do this when i just save it all and then i do the same thing with the um hunger games yes so you'll already have the script so you'll download the hunger games you'll read it in then you'll clean it just like we did before you'll create your um your word cloud and your um, bar plot, but you'll want to look at different words that make more sense for the Hunger Games for your word association or correlations. Okay, okay. Okay, I think I, I think I got it. Hey, 
Professor, uh, the paper, it's an uh, exec executive summary just like we did for um, the last assignment, pretty much. So for the paper, um, just one page, try to follow um, what it says to write about. Uh, so it's a little different than an executive summary because um, uh, I don't know. you could try to structure it that way. How could it help do prescriptive analytics? So that could be how you make um, recommendations on it especially if you're doing from a marketing angle. But ideally, just answer. Um, answer the question. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. Not, we didn't do this, the kind of analysis that we're going to do in the future where an executive summary makes a lot more sense. This was just kind of the first foray into uh, using R. Uh, double spaced or single spaced? Double spaced. All right. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I did that on the other one. <laughs> but yeah, I thought I'd ask. Okay. And I'm heading out. See you later, Professor. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Here. I don't know. I don't think that's a problem. Let me see if it's on my other computer. Because this is this is a, a lab computer, so I don't think it makes a difference. Yeah, I might. I assume it's just a particular version. Yeah, I don't know. Hey. Oh. Um, I just went through some basic stuff in R, how to save an R file, and some like basic calculator code and how to write a function. We'll do um, at the beginning of 603, since I know you're using R a lot. I'll go back to what I'm doing kind of eventually. It won't be too bad. Because the problem is, when we have our next class, so there may be students that didn't take this class at all, so we'll have to go back to that.
see like any real correlation between any things. I ran different things like uh, I'm going through I like have, I think um, I had it up because um so like, like the grade, annual income, debt to income ratio. We're gonna rerun all those variables and bigger algorithms. So and R, and you can see R, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was just like I said, this is the first time people have seen real data ever. <laughs> so <laughs> I, exactly. I was just I, going through. I was like, I couldn't see because usually, you know, you, your lower grade of loans you should have. You would expect higher write-offs on those type of loans, mm -hmm. and you expect people with higher type of income or less annual income to have more of that. But it was like, guy yeah, makes six hundred thousand dollars a year. It's like has write-offs on loans. Like, how is that even possible? <laughs> yeah, we're not. It's like, that's why I tried to send out the, the message saying, I'm not expecting anything major here because from your regression, the R squared would have been really low. So it been, yeah, it you was. weren't able to develop Even a Even the different scenarios I did just to try to get it higher, I couldn't get it above like 0.462 or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. We're only looking at four variables instead of, you know, yeah, yeah. all of them. <laughs> and then you'll find what, what really matters. I have one question. I'm sorry to bother you, but... Are we still looking for the association of the words freedom and dream? And no, so that, no, you want to you want to pick words okay. that make better sense to the Hunger Games text. Okay, great. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. You're still there. That's, I think that's what it should look like, but I don't know why you would get anything that tells you to run it explicitly because it should have been in the code up here where it's it's going to a server and trying to download it.
Okay, so as long as it, it's working. It's a, it's a, 